something that I think appeals to almost every citizen in the state. Even if you didn't go to either one of those schools, if you're from the state of Michigan, usually you fall into one camp or the other. When I went to Michigan, half the guys that went to Michigan State a place that played against them in high school. You got green and white homes in part of the block, and you've got maize and blue homes elsewhere. I really didn't have that big rivalry when I came here because we kicked the crap out of them all the time. They have their moments and their days, but over the hall, they're not in our league. I was told, you know, if I went to Michigan State, it would never beat Michigan. Real winners with fans in the state of Michigan. We got two great universities, and we play each other, and it's like a holiday. Hello, I'm Mickey York for Spotlight, presented by Bushlight. Ann Arbor and East Lansing are about 65 miles apart. The proximity makes for a heated pigskin fight every fall with friends and family split in their allegiance. Currently, these two football programs seem to be on as a level of ground as ever in their head-to-head -head battles. But there have been many ebbs and flows for football dominance in the state over the last century. And although many have competed and many more have enjoyed watching, it was really just a few that made it what it is today. You wait for that Michigan Michigan State game because of the people in a state won't let you forget it. When you anticipate a major rival, you have a lot of fun leading into the game. And I think the anticipation for all these events makes uh, makes it what it is. I mean, it makes it worthwhile. You see banners everywhere about beat Michigan, and you kind of you learn very quickly what the importance of that game is. Gas station attendants going to remind you of the Michigan Michigan State game. The locker room attendant at the gym is going to remind you. So everybody reminds you of the Michigan Michigan State game. Those of us who uh, graduated from Michigan State played at Michigan State. If there's any game we want to win throughout the year, uh, it's against Michigan. When you have a winning way, you always have a little more confidence going into the game and. Uh, whether you're better or not, uh, you know, you have that edge. Well, Michigan's been established a long, long time. They're a tremendous university. They, they do things the right way. And we do a lot of copying some of the great things that they do. We had our games, we called them blue letter games, which were important. We had red letter games that were even more important, but we had a green letter game that was very important. You better not uh, uh, take a play off in this series because you'll pay for it. Well, there's no doubt in our mind, Michigan is the number one opponent that uh, we are most interested in. In 1901, Fielding Yost's first Michigan team, the so-called point-a-minute squad, outscored its opponents by a margin of 550 to nothing on its way to a perfect season. Michigan finished that season with a 49-0 victory in the inaugural Rose Bowl on January 1, 1902, over Stanford. Some said a victory so lopsided officials would choose not to host the bowl for another 12 years. 1902, Fielding Yost brings his point-a-minute teams against Michigan State, then the Aggies, and whoops them 119-0. to zero. That's called rubbing it in. Yost and his seemingly unstoppable Wolverines would lose a total of only three games to the teams from East Lansing between 1901 and 1933, including a 14-year winning streak in which Michigan outscored Michigan State 390 to nine. That was until 1934, when Notre Dame alumnus Charlie Bachman would lead his young Michigan State team to victory over Michigan. It was the school's first win over the Wolverines since 1915. Bachman would follow that up with three more consecutive wins. State had had some pretty good years, and Michigan was on a down in 37. So Fritz Chrysler came as the, as the coach to Michigan, and from then on started the, the change. Michigan State's reign would prove short-lived, 
After their 1937 loss, the Wolverines, under the watchful eyes of Fritz Chrysler and Benny Oosterbahn, would not lose again to Michigan State until 1950. But like almost 20 years earlier, that was about to change. They had a great president during those years named John Hanna, and he, I think, was given credit for bringing Michigan State up into the higher echelons of the Big Ten, if you will, uh, and a lot of it due to uh, the heavy emphasis on getting a winning great football team, which they did. He's the one that came here and, and uh, made things happen when he hired Biggie Munn in 47, and then with Duffy Doherty. When Michigan State made a push to become a nationally recognized university, they did it with athletics. In specifics, they did it with football. We didn't have, uh, you know, why, why would Michigan want Michigan State in the Big Ten and take some of their thunder? They didn't. By the 1940s, Michigan State College's president, John Hanna, was pressing hard to make his school a nationally recognized institution, and he knew football would play a major part of that effort. To compete for the state funds required to foster that growth, he knew he needed someone to end the University of Michigan's nearly 50-year gridiron dominance of them. He chose Clarence Biggie Munn to be that man. Without further success, the school risked developing something of a chip on its shoulder with respect to its in-state football rival, the University of Michigan. State does have a chip on its shoulder in a big way in this game, but it's a well-earned chip, and you have to thank Fritz Chrysler for starting that chip. When Biggie Munn, who played for Chrysler at Minnesota and coached here at Michigan, believe it or not, with Chrysler, came back to coach Michigan State, Chrysler at the first press conference says, and what brings you back to this fair state, Mr. Munn? That's arrogance. Chrysler himself, um, probably wasn't too enthralled with them coming into the conference. He felt that they were a little, a little lesser institution, which they're not. Why would Michigan want Michigan State in the Big Ten and take some of their thunder? Uh, I can see their point of view, they didn't. But because of President Hanna, we became a member of the Big Ten. That was a big move. Uh, sure, Michigan did everything they could to protect their own field and we would have done the same thing. Yeah, you know, it's just one of those things, but uh, that's the way he preached it. Uh, you know, who are they to think they can beat Michigan? When you take a look what Fritz Chrysler did years ago, affected this uh, rivalry, because I think he's, you know, he put a little, uh, uh, a little gasoline on the fire. We're a very young as far as a program. See, our, our program really didn't start until Biggie came in 47. We started off as an agriculture school, and uh, in all honesty, football brought Michigan State to the front of people in the United States knowing about Michigan State because how well Biggie Munn and Duffy Doherty did. There's no doubt that uh, uh, Biggie uh, felt, uh, you know, a lot of pressure, particularly when he went down to Michigan. In the 1947 Michigan State-Michigan game, this was the first game that Biggie Munn coached the Spartans and against his old boss, Fitz Chrysler, he takes the Spartans into Michigan Stadium and get trounced. He was very motivated by playing them. He got beat his first year bad, 55 nothing. Uh, after that game, after the Michigan game, that he stood on the bench and the tears just rolled down his eyes. And he swore that it never happened again. And it didn't. Among the varied trophies that college football teams do annual battle to win, Michigan has had its annual competition for the Little Brown Jug with Minnesota since 1903, the nation's first. And Michigan State has clashed with Notre Dame since 1949 for the Megaphone Trophy. So those are always there for the winner to take home. But I think what has disturbed a lot of people is that when Michigan State won that game and they couldn't find a Paul Bunyan Trophy. The whole trophy is a fabrication by the governor to try to create goodwill and so on between Michigan and Michigan State. It starts the year Michigan State enters the Big Ten in 1953. And neither side liked it all that much. It's big, it's ugly, it's, you can't carry it, you need to wheel it around. Regardless of what it is, I think that uh, that's, uh, that, that was not very good class. That, you know, the class wasn't there. 
Uh, the whole thing makes little sense, but as Lloyd Carr said, it is the biggest, ugliest trophy in college football, and when you lose it, you really miss it. We want to give him a nice, uh, secure place to live and to spend his years. So hopefully that trophy will never leave Ann Arbor, because we don't want him going up there. You talk about a rivalry for Michigan, Michigan State. I really didn't have that big rivalry when I came here because uh, we kick the crap out of them all the time. In the 1950s, John Hanna's investment in his football staff began to pay off. Michigan State won its first national championship in 1951 after a 9-0 season. They would repeat the same feat that next year. The memories of losing to the University of Michigan seemed to begin to fade. I really didn't have that big rivalry when I came here because uh, we kicked the crap out of them all the time. Michigan longtime radio announcer Bob Eufer, who's well known, known, now deceased, I spotted for him in the 52 Michigan State Michigan game. And the Wolverines go off to a 13 to nothing lead, and he's going bonkers because the Wolverines had done so well. And I, and I reminded Bob that Spartans are explosive and might come back. On the Michigan State 30-yard line, Michigan State has the ball, and they trail in this ball game by the unbelievable margin of 13 to nothing. And off goes to Don McAuliffe. Beautiful blocking there as McAuliffe swings wide around right end. He gets past the first wave of defenders, threads his way through the rest, and suddenly McAuliffe breaks into the clear, and he is off for a Michigan State touchdown. 70 yards. Got the Spartans into the game. They ended up winning the game 27 to 13. Uh, you take from 1951 uh, when I came here, we were national champions. We won that game. 52, we were national champions. We won that game. 53, we were Rose Bowl champions. We won that game. Having seen the Wolverines fall to the Spartans for most of the 50s and 60s, the University of Michigan's newest athletic director, Don Canham, made a big change in Michigan in December 1968. Canham was a brilliant, brilliant man. Bo worked all those years with a handshake. Uh, great loyalty to each other, great honesty. But Bo was a big part of it, big, big part of it. When Bo Schembechler first came here, you know, he, he established himself and said, I'm a Michigan man now. I think Bo's first year here was uh, 69. And if you recollect, he lost that game. And he, being an Ohio guy, he thought Ohio State was everything. And I think he found out differently. And he used to tell us every year that, that I played here that, that he was mistaken in thinking that the Ohio State game was bigger. Michigan State game, no matter what they say about the Michigan-Ohio State rivalry, is the game in Michigan. Because it gives you bragging rights in your backyard. And uh, the only thing that's diminished that game is the fact that Michigan's been able to dominate uh, over the last 30 years. Michigan was winning the um, majority of the games. So I, I think Michigan didn't take them as serious as being, okay, this is not a real tradition until you start winning more games. And rightfully so. And Michigan State just have to go and be able to step up to the table, start winning more games and make Michigan pay attention. When Michigan State University announced George Perlis as their newest head coach in 1983, Bo Schembechler and his staff at Michigan paid very close attention. And he knew it was going to get competitive, and it got a far more respectful during that time. There's a great deal of mutual respect between Bo and Perlis to this day. When we got hired, he called the staff together. He said, the picnic's over. And that, I thought, was a tremendous uh, compliment. You can't play against Michigan if you're the Spartans. Uh, you can't play against uh, Michigan State if you're the Wolverines and not have it be a red-letter game. We went pretty hard to get ready for them, and we're, they, they, were, they were not to be underestimated ever again after 1969. No matter how your season's going or their season's going, you feel like you have to win this game. I mean, if you can't get pumped up for that game, I mean, there's something wrong with you as a Michigan player. Because, I mean, it, you got your Ohio States, and of course, but the Michigan State game is a, a pure bragging right uh, for in-state rivalry. You don't want to go to the gas station on Monday and uh, and talk to the next guy at the pump. You don't want to go to the grocery store. You don't want to go get a hamburger. 
and, uh, and hear about losing this game. Well, you knew if you come off a loss from Michigan State that uh, that next week of practice is going to be something fierce. And, uh, and it should have been. It makes it difficult when you go out of the practice and you leave practice and you see the students walking around with the shirts beat Michigan all week long starting on Sunday. But uh, it, was, it was not good when you lost, lost to Michigan. All year long, you had to hear about it, how great they were, how, 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 how much they've improved, they've come of age, all of these things. It uh, goes through the entire athletic department. It's not just something that uh, is at the football building. You will have that feeling for, uh, for one year. You win, it's euphoria. You lose, let's get them again. Let's get back at them. That's, again, it goes back to the fact that it's not just a rivalry on the field or uh, newspapers or what have you. Well, if you won, it was a beautiful week. They had great enthusiasm. They practiced hard. If you lost, you got to get up there and pump them up. You know how you say, don't go there. You don't need to go there. Let the guys play the game. Let the coaches coach and the fans have a good time. Bo Schembechler would emphasize the importance of the Michigan-Michigan State game after his first year 1969 loss, going on to win the next eight straight matchups. But that continued dominance of MSU seemed to allow Bo to focus once again on Ohio State, building it to be arguably the country's greatest interstate rivalry. I'm sure that Michigan State fans feel that there's an arrogant about a University of Michigan fan. I think it's a person that doesn't understand tradition at Michigan. Started out being Michigan Agricultural College, Michigan State College, Michigan State University. It's always been U of M. Started being the Farmers, the Aggies, and now the Spartans. Always been the Wolverines. But that feeds into the Michigan arrogance. I'm certain of it. Daryl Rogers named them pretty good one time when he beat them. He called them the arrogant. I'm going to call them jackasses, but he used a different word. <laughs> um, that's an interesting comment. He has his he has his opinions, and everybody else has theirs. Arrogant asses is a uh, pretty funny for the moment. Again, you pay for it the rest of your your career. There are people in uh, probably in both camps who don't always say the right thing, and uh, who maybe take it to a level that, you know how you say, don't go there. You don't need to go there. Whether he uh, gets credit for it or not, uh, it was under his regime, and uh, I'm sure he wouldn't want no part of that. If there are Michigan fans who want to believe that uh, this rivalry really isn't important to Michigan, because after all, it's only Michigan State, you know, they have every right to feel that way if they want to. They're wrong, and, you know, sooner or later their day will come. There was a time, um, I think, when we did act that way. There were a few people, I, don't, I wouldn't put it across the board, but we had some of our representatives act that way, and, um, and the Michigan State people were the brunt of it. Well, I, I, I don't think we're arrogant answers. I think we're, we're confident and believe in our school and talk about it, and majority speaking, we had a great experience here. You listen to me talk, we had arrogance when we were winning. Sure, we kind of laughed, you know, we knew we were going to win. Led by quarterback Dennis Franklin, 1973 found Bo Schembechler's undefeated Michigan Wolverines hosting their final game of the season to Woody Hayes' similarly undefeated Ohio State Buckeyes in Ann Arbor. After an injury to Franklin during the game and a missed Michigan attempt at a final game-winning field goal, the game finished in a 10-10 tie. Soon after in Chicago, the conference athletic directors voted in emergency session who would receive the remaining Rose Bowl bid. Burt Smith, Michigan alum, AD at Michigan State, votes against the Wolverines. The vote is 6-4 in Ohio State's favor. Yeah, and Michigan State voted against Michigan. Now that was the dumbest thing they could have ever done. That, no matter how, how you ended up, was the bitterest moment I've ever had in coaching. That was the biggest defeat I've ever been dealt, nor will I ever. I can't conceive of there being anything uh, worse than what they did to my team. 
There was nobody in his right mind um, that didn't know my senior year that you know, we had bested Ohio State for the greater portion of the football game. Taking the high road is uh, difficult to do, but it's the way to go. And if those people think that I'm ever gonna forget that, they got another thing coming. With the bitter feelings of Fritz Chrysler's campaign haunting the rivalry's past, Michigan State now took a substantial jab back at Bo Schembechler's Michigan team. You gotta call it even at that point. Certainly, if anything uh, controversial or spectacular happens uh, in a Spartan Wolverine game, it's gonna be talked about for years. One such play that looms large over the years is the seeming interference on Desmond Howard in 1990 that was never called. It infuriates you when that kind of a thing can take a great game and reduce it to that, that level, that one call to make a decision on the game. Every time we win that one now, it's the officials did it. Oh, the officials took the play away. Uh, the clock ran out. Or so it seemed to many during the matchup in 2001, when Michigan State quarterback Jeff Smoker found T.J. Duckett open in the end zone for a game-winning touchdown pass. You want the game to come down to it and the players decide. Not a guy in the, in the box that's clicking the clock, not a guy down on the field who says, I didn't see it or anything. You want it to come down to where the players make the plays. But since then, uh, the people up in the press box no longer have the time uh, at their command. They have it down from the field. The referee does that now. Do you still cheat it? They deserved better. I guess you'd have to say we've always gotten a better shake to Michigan. Hey, all we can do is go out there and play our best game. And things are going to happen. You know, we have no control over that. All we got control over is how we play this game. Those kinds of things are fuel for conversations with your neighbor, with your buddy, all winter long. Well, I think the next year is real important because you can carry it for about that long. Um, of course, you got to play next week, too. you got to forget it pretty quick, but it's still in the back of your mind. Those type of things, you know, enhance the rivalry. I know you get upset when they happen to your school at the time, but they enhance the rivalry, and they make it more important each and every year. The whole thing adds up to me to a great rivalry. Whether it's Fritz Chrysler stacking the deck against Michigan State's attempt to join the Big Ten or Daryl Rogers' unfortunate comment, the spotlight always shines brighter on this rivalry. And although there's been some controversy, politics, and even a little bad blood, no one can deny that there's been some good, hard, clean football. And for one day every fall, you're either on one side of the state or the other. It's nice to know that our civil war can be so safe and entertaining, and the wounds can heal with a chance for redemption the next season. For Spotlight, presented by Bushlight, I'm Mickey York.